Well, if you don't know me or you haven't met me yet, my name is Pastor Justin. I am so glad to be here with you again as we begin our time in meeting Jesus through his word today. Um, Our scripture comes from Exodus chapter 33, verses 1 through 23. So let us hear the words of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people. And I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. And no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments. And I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments out Mount Horeb. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his own tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp But his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not yet let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and have found favor with you, or you found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, because I am pleased with you. And I know you by name. Then Moses said, now, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and most loving God, we are so grateful to step into your presence. Because we want to see your glory. We want to see you for who you are in this moment. And so I pray, Lord, that you would remove the veil. I pray that you would remove any barriers that might stand in our way. Anything that's going on in our life right now that might cause us to to be distracted from tuning into you. We ask that we would see you. That we would hear your voice. That you would speak loudly and clearly in this moment. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, I uh, grew up in the 80s. 
And as a child of the 80s, one of my favorite movies from that time is The Princess Bride. How many of you have seen that movie? Several of you. It looks like there's a few who haven't. So let me kind of give you kind of a summary so you can uh, know a little bit about where we're going to see in just a minute. Uh, it, it's a story about a girl by the name of Buttercup and a farmhand by the name of Wesley. And, and over time, these two fall in love, but Wesley takes off to seek out his fortune. Uh, and, and so he, he takes off to sea, and while he's gone, he promises that he's going to come back, but he gets attacked by the ship of the dread pirate Roberts, this, this, this ruthless pirate that never leaves any prisoners alive. And so Buttercup goes into this period of deep, deep mourning. She goes into it for about a period of five years, but at that point, the prince in town, he, Prince Humperdinck, decides that he wants to marry her, and he has the right as the prince of the land to marry any of the young maidens that he chooses. And, and so uh, she agrees to this. But on the day of their engagement, she's kidnapped by a band of three bandits. One is a Sicilian boss by the name of Vicini. Another is a giant by the name of Fezzik, and the third is a master swordsman by the name of Inigo Montoya. And he's out for revenge because uh, his father had been murdered. Well, before long, Indigo notices that they're being followed, and he starts to ask a few questions, and that's where the clip that we're going to see uh, takes up. So take a look at this clip. Why are you doing that? Making sure nobody's following us. That would be inconceivable. Despite what you think, you will be caught. And when you are, the prince will see you all hanged. You are sure nobody's following us? As I told you, it would be absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable. What Elder knows what we've done, and no one in Florin could have gotten here so fast. He's climbing the rope. And he's gaining on us. Inconceivable. Faster! I thought I was going faster. You got very good arms. He didn't fall? Inconceivable! You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Now, words are one of the most powerful forces in our world. You know, through our words, we build our world. We either tear down or we build up. We construct or we destroy. They have the power to bring life, but they also have the power to bring death. But many times, just like Vicini, we use words that we don't really understand what they mean. Right? We might think they mean something. We might have per certain preconceived ideas in our mind about what those words actually are. But we don't really understand fully what they mean. You know, one of the most common words that we throw around in the life of the church is this word disciple. Disciple. It's one of the most significant words in the Bible. It appears 269 times, both in reference to who we're called to be but also in reference to what we are to do as God's people. When Jesus defines the mission of the church, he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. But here's the question I have to you. Do we really understand what a disciple is? I mean, we use this word all the time, but we, do we know what a disciple is? Do we know what that word means? Do we know what it looks like to be a disciple right now in this day and age at this moment in time? You know, I think a lot of times we don't fully grasp what this means. And if I were to ask you guys, what's a disciple? I'd get a, about as many different answers as there are people in this room. Or, or, or maybe I might get a blank stare from you because you don't really know how to define the word at all. But here's the thing. If we don't know what a disciple is and we don't know what a disciple looks like, then how can we assess and measure how well we are doing at actually making disciples? Right? That's what we say as United Methodists, that our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. But what if we don't know what a disciple is, how do we know how we're doing? 
And so today we are beginning a new series called Disciple What? Disciple What? Where, where we are going to be wrestling with what it actually looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this day and age. And we're going to take a look at seven different images over the next seven weeks to talk about what a disciple is. Now, we could have probably used a few other images and things along the way, but, but I think these things are at least the seven essentials about what it really looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about the sacrifice of a disciple. Uh, we're going to talk about the love of a disciple. We're going to talk about the community of a disciple, the generosity of a disciple, the service of a disciple, the task of a disciple, and today, the faith of a disciple. This is an advancing. So the term disciple actually comes from the realm of education. Education. Uh, and, and in Bible times, education began at a very early age when all the little boys and girls would go off to the school of the Torah. And while they were there, they'd learn to read, they'd learn to write, and they would learn to recite by memory the first five books of the Old Testament. And at that point, most of the kids would go back home. They, the girls would go back, take care of the house. The, the boys would go back home, take on the trade of their father. And, and, but those who were especially gifted, especially talented, they would go on to the next stage of schooling where they would learn the deeper meanings of the scriptures. And, and they would learn about the, the Old Testament. They would learn to recite the entire Old Testament by memory. And from that group, there were a few who would raise to the top. And only those would then go on to enter into a life of discipleship. A life of discipleship with a rabbi. And they would choose which rabbi they wanted to follow. And then they would do everything with this rabbi for the next two to three years. They would go where he went. They would walk where he walked, slept where he slept, ate what he ate. They, their job was to simply observe his way of life so that they could become like the rabbi in everything he did. Right? That they would look like the rabbi. They would act like the rabbi. They would talk like the rabbi in every single way. And when they were ready, they were then released to go out and make disciples of their own. You see, this is what Jesus means when he defines this term disciple, that, that we are to look like Jesus and act like Jesus and think like Jesus in everything we do. That a disciple is a true reflection of the master, a true reflection of the master, that we are going to look like Jesus in everything that we do and say. That we are going to think like him and look like him and act like him. That when we look in the mirror, what we should see staring back at us is not all our faults. It's not all our failures. It's not all our sins. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Right? That is what we are shooting for when we say that we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ in the church. But here's the thing. See, to become like Jesus requires a significant investment of time, of time, right? It's not going to happen overnight, right? It's not going to come by osmosis. We do not drift into the things of God, right? If anything, we drift away from the things of God in our world. It takes constant, ongoing time and relationship with the master in order to become like our master, right? That's why the disciples went everywhere with Jesus, Right? It's why they walked around with him and, and observed him and asked him questions about what he was doing. They were constantly with the master. And over time, what happened is they become like him. And so Jesus sends them out to do the same things that he was doing. Right? To heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the kingdom of God because they'd seen he just did it. They could emulate the very image of the master because they had spent significant time with him. And the same is true with us. That true discipleship is always lived out in relationship with Jesus Christ. It's always lived out in relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, faith and discipleship, their core are about relationship. Relationship. To, to be a disciple of Jesus means that, that we know Jesus. 
that we know him through and through, that we are living every moment of every day in relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus put it like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, right? That takes relationship. But I think a lot of the times when we think about faith, we kind of reduce faith to these set of ideas, right? Or or, a set of certain beliefs that we need to to believe certain things about Jesus or certain things about God, that we need to believe God is real, that we need to believe that we're sinners in need of grace, that we need to believe Jesus died for us, that we need to believe that he rose again, that the faith almost becomes this intellectual exercise where we are assenting to a few key ideas. But, but here's the thing. A lot of people know about Jesus. They, they know some specific facts about Jesus, some details about his way of life. Some of them might even come to church on a regular basis. But there's a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. A big difference between knowing some facts about Jesus and actually living in relationship with him every moment of every day. So think of it this way. I'm a big IndyCar fan. Uh, if you're around me long enough, you'll know that. And I know the driver's names. I know what team they drive for. I know who they used to drive for. I know the numbers of their cars and their sponsors and all that stuff. I read the websites every single day. There, there are probably some people who could even tell me their birth dates and their pets' names. I don't know all that kind of stuff. But, <laughs> but, but you see, I don't know them. I know some stuff about them, but I don't really know them because I'm not living in relationship with them day in and day out. I mean, they, 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 for the most part, I don't know what happens behind closed doors in their life. There's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. Right? And Jesus wants us to know him. Right? To know him deeply, to know him passionately, to live in relationship with him at every single moment of the day. And so look at Moses in our text for today, because I think Moses really shows us what a disciple looks like. I mean, notice what Moses does. I mean, I just love this in the middle. He takes a tent, he pitches it outside the, di- outside the camp so he can meet with Jesus, so he can meet with God. Right? That's why it's called the tent of meeting, because that's its purpose, right? It's a place to meet with God. It's a place to hear his heart. It's a place to, to hear his voice. It's a place to, to discern his will. And it says that he goes there every single day. That he is constantly dwelling in the presence of God. And because of that, notice what it says in verse 11. The Lord would speak to him face to face as a person speaks with their friend. Right? There's real relationship there, right? Real intimacy. I mean, it, it's, it's this up close and personal thing, right? It's face to face, right? It's not over the phone, right? It's not by a text message. It's not by Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram. It's not by any of that kind of stuff. It's face to face communication because he is in the immediate presence of God, right? Dwelling in relationship with him every day because he wants to be more like him. And so Deuteronomy 34 verse 10 says this, since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses who the Lord knew face to face. There was a uniqueness to their relationship because he dwelt in the immediate presence of God. You know, that term no in the Hebrew actually means intimate knowledge. Intimate knowledge. It's the kind of knowledge that only a husband has of their wife and their wife of their husband. It's, It's the kind of knowledge where there's no secrets, where you know every detail, that nothing is hidden. That, that, they, that, that you know the good, you know the bad, you know the ugly, there's openness, there's vulnerability there. That, that, that there is knowledge at the essence of what knowledge is. That Moses is known by God and Moses knows God. 
The psalmist puts it like this, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. In other words, he finishes his sentences, right? Oh, Lord, you you create my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's wound. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your, your eyes saw my unformed body. How precious to me are your thoughts. Oh God, how, how vast is the sum of them? If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sands. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you hear the intimacy there? Do you hear the relationship? Do you, do you hear... The openness and the vulnerability is this idea that, that we are known fully as we are with no mask, where, where we can be our real, authentic selves in the presence of God because we can be fully known by him. Right? That's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. And I think one of the best ways to, to describe it in our world is the, to think of dating or marriage. You know, some of us who are married can remember how we first fell in love with our spouse. And we can remember how our thoughts were focused on that person. You know, Melissa and I first started dating, and there was this new giddiness to life. Right? I'd bound up the stairs of my dorm. I couldn't wait to see her. I would wait for that next call or that next text, right? I, I was constantly longing to be in her presence, and I believe that God wants that same thing from us. That we would long to be in his presence. That we couldn't live without his presence. That we would desire to spend time with him. Not just for one hour on Sunday morning. But at every single moment of the day. That we would desire to have intimacy and honesty and openness and and vulnerability in our relationship with him. And that's what Moses wants. I, I, I love this. That, that's our second point. A, a disciple of Jesus is never content without the presence of God. Never content without the presence of God. So let me set the scene for you a little bit. Back in chapter 32 of Exodus, that's the... the those whole scenario where Moses has gone up on the mountain and he's up there to get the Ten Commandments and he's been up there a little bit too long and people get worried. And they think that Moses has maybe died or something and they need a leader, somebody to guide them. And and so they erect a golden calf and they start to worship this thing. And and God gets furious. (laughs) Absolutely furious with them. And so by the time chapter 33 opens, the people of God are at a crisis moment in their faith. What's going to happen? They don't quite uh, understand what's going to happen next. And what God says is, I'm not going with you. I'm still going to ensure that my promises are fulfilled. Right? I'm a God who is faithful. I'm not going to walk away because you have forsaken me. Right? My promises, my blessing, my Angel, it's all still going with you. Now, most of us would think that's a pretty good deal. Right? I mean, we get God's blessings. We get his promises. We, 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 get, his, we get the promised land. We still got all this stuff. We, 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 get, we get all this stuff. But for Moses, that's not enough. It doesn't matter if he has God's blessing if God himself isn't in it. But Moses refused. 
refuses to even take one step until God goes with him himself. And so what's he do? He goes out and he sets up a camp, a tent outside the camp so he can meet with God until God changes his mind. Right? Notice verse 15. If your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. I'm not leaving if you're not going. I'm not leaving if you're not in it. He wants to make sure that every single decision, every step he takes is in the immediate presence of God. Because as a disciple of Jesus Christ, the presence of God is the most important thing we have. I think so many times in the church, we, we think what we really want is the blessings. Right? We want to know we're going to heaven. We want to know if we're forgiven. We want to know that he hears us. He'll answer our prayers. But do we really want his presence? Do we really want his presence? Because because Moses, he he wants his presence more than anything else. It it doesn't matter if he has his blessing. It it doesn't matter if he has his promises. It doesn't matter if he has all that other stuff if God isn't there. God is the most important thing because we cannot operate without the presence of God working and moving in our lives. Jesus for survival. And so David puts it this way, as a deer pants for streams of living water, so my soul cries out for you, O God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. That I long for you as a man longs for water in a barren land where there is no water. They they desire the presence of God more than anything else. And so the question I want to ask you is, have you hungered and thirsted for the presence of God with that kind of passion? Have you desired his presence more than anything else in your life so bad that you say, I'm not moving unless you're in it. I'm not moving unless I know you're going with me. I'm not moving, Lord God, unless you are here. And so I'm going to go out right now and set up a tent of meeting. How many of us have said, I'm going to make a spot in my house, in my car, at the park, wherever, where I'm just going to go meet with God? So I know that he's in it. Do we hunger for his presence? And then finally, we see that the disciple of Jesus Christ always grows in their relationship with Jesus. They are always growing. They're not content with where they are. I'm reminded of this story that Pastor Scott Daniels, uh, who's a pastor several years ago out of uh, Pasadena, Nazarene, and, and he would tell this story, and, and every now and then he'd call the shut-ins in his church just to see how they were doing. And then there was this one lady in his congregation that he hated to call. And he hated it because she always called him to carpet on things. And, and so he, he called her up and said, hey, how you doing? And they had their nice little niceties for a while. How's the weather? And all those kinds of things. And how you feeling? And, and then eventually she turned, point blank said, Scott, how's your faith going? And he said, well, I'm kind of coasting right now. And she said, you know, Scott, there's only one way to coast. 
know. I wonder how many of us are coasting. How many of us have grown stagnant? How many of us are not moving forward and growing in our faith? And we've been in the same spot we've been at for the last 10 years. See, what characterizes Moses' faith more than anything else is he always wants more. More than he has right now. I mean, we're already told that he's in relationship with God. He's meeting God in this tent. He's speaking with him face to face as a friend that he, he knows God. But he still wants more. And so Moses asks him just two questions. First, he says, God, show me your ways. Show me your ways. Because to know God's ways is to know God. And to know God's ways is to, to be obedient to him. It's to know his will for your life. But then he goes even further and he says, show me your glory. Your glory. And, and that term is a term and it's only used in the Bible for God himself. It refers to the full weightiness of God's presence, this, this, this thing that, that when it descends on the place that you can feel it, right? It's his honor, it's his splendor, it's his riches, it's his beauty, it's his majesty, it's God in all that God is. That he doesn't want God with veiled a little, little bit. Right? He wants to see God as God is at the very core of, of who God is. And see, each question wants to go a little deeper. Right? Each question wants to know a little bit more. I don't know what it is it's this thing. That with each question, he's effectively peeling back another layer of the onion. So I want you to think about this. Like, think of it like this. God is like this vast ocean. right? He, he's waiting to be explored. But there's several ways you can explore the ocean. Some people spend their entire life on the beach just looking and ooing and eyeing over the beauty of the ocean. but they don't get close enough for the ocean to touch them. Right? They don't get close enough for the ocean to change their lives. They stay at a place where it's safe and it's comfortable and it never touches us and it never changes us. Now, other people might wade out into the water a little bit. Right? They get their feet wet, go out, but, it, but it's still safe. Right? It's still comfortable. You're still in that place where... Well, maybe God can take care of your problems. Maybe he can pour out his blessing on your life. Maybe he can do all these kinds of things, but, but you're still in control, right? Because your feet are still on the bottom. You see, what Moses is saying is, I want to go into the deep. I want to go into the and, and explain. Or go under the waves and explore God for who he really is. I don't want to be in control anymore. And that place is scary, right? When you start to swim and your feet come off the bottom, it's scary. Because you lose control. The more you learn who God is, the more you become like him, the more you lose yourself. Right? Moses is never satisfied with where he is. He's not content with just seeing what's on the surface. He wants to go deeper and deeper and deeper. He wants to go out beneath the waves. He, and he shows us that a true disciple is never content with where we are.
Right? When we look in the mirror, do we actually see him? Are, are we giving him more than just one hour a week? How much time and communication does he get in a week, in a day? He just, he, does he get the leftovers when we're tired? When we've used the best energy we have? Does he get our first and best energy of the day? How are you seeking to grow? How are you going deeper? And so as we begin this series, what I want to challenge you to do is to do two things. All right, number, number one. Number one. Establish a tent of meeting somewhere in your life. You know, a place that you're going to go every single day to meet with God, a special place that's reserved for the presence of God. And the second thing is to spend some time in his words. Because the Bible is the clearest revelation that we have of Jesus Christ. The clearest picture of God. And so in your bulletins today, there's a reading plan. Um, some of this is what uh, Arun had already given you, um, but I added to that uh, to go through the end of this series. And um, I added specifically the Gospel of Matthew onto it because when we look at the Gospels, we see Jesus clearer than we do anywhere else because we see what Jesus did, right? And if our goal is to become like Jesus, we need to watch Jesus, Right, so I want to challenge you to spend some time every single day throughout this series dwelling in the presence of God. I gave some questions for you to process and to think through so you're not just reading, but you're actually thinking about what this means for my life. So let us pray. Jesus, we come to you. We come to you because we want to be like you. We desire to be like you. We want more of you. We want to be hungry and thirsty for your presence. We want to be like Moses who refuses to move if you're not in it. So give us the strength meet with you. And if we need to cut other things out to make time, show us what that is. We ask this in the name of Jesus.